Good morning, Church the Apostles, family and friends. I've, as you can see, I've got our new uh, Coda logo mask on that were designed for us by one of our members and uh, made actually by a nonprofit over in New Orleans. So just a really a double blessing for us. We're able to support a group over in New Orleans as well as um, have something that is just kind of uh, individual and unique for us. I'm going to take the mask off. Um, I'll be, anytime I'm preaching, I'll probably have my mask off. It's just easier for me. And um, just another humor aside, it fogs up my glasses when I, I get speaking too much. So, um, but once again, we are encouraging masks. We're not encouraging. We really are requiring masks, um, especially since our governor has made that a mandate for our state. And it's just a good thing to do. I really want to say a few things uh, in announcement wise. And we are reopening today, if you're listening to this on Sunday the 19th, and our first um, live, if you will, in-person services. We're having two on Sunday at 8 and 10. Um, we're limiting those numbers to 40. We'll be doing social distancing. Um, as we said over and over, everything's being done on the pavilion outside. So we feel like this is going to be one of the safest places to be as as we gather. Um, during the week, we're going to offer three um, smaller venues of, of worship on the pavilion. I'm at 715 on Tuesday and, and at noon on Thursday, and then we're going to do a six o'clock on Wednesday. And so we have two daytime, one evening service. We're limiting those numbers to 20. Um, on the pavilion, all five of those services we need you to sign up for. That way we can have an account of who's there in case someone um, is compromised with coronavirus, we know who to contact. If you forget to sign up and you come and there's space available, of course we will invite you in to worship with us. We'll just take your name so that we have a record of that. So five services starting this Sunday. Um, each Monday, we're going to send out a notice where you can sign up um, for the, the services that are um, in the future, and we encourage you to do that. Um, we're excited to see you. I pray that you're safe. Um, one other little thing that we are going to offer, for those of you who feel like you can never get out in public yet, um, if you would like to have home communion, we have a very simple protocol um, that our bishop has laid out for us. We can come with pre-consecrated bread, and during that service, we'll have about a 15-minute visit with you. Prefer it to be outside on the porch, but if it's inside, we'll do social distancing and just kind of limit um, the, the length of that. We do have some real clear protocol for those of you who might be concerned about how we're going to distribute communion. We're only doing it bread only. It's only no wine. Um, we'll bring family units, be that a one, two, three, four, five, six, one, at a time, social distancing, kind of like you find when you're in a, a store or a grocery store or something where they have it marked out. And you'll be receiving the bread, um, and then you'll go back to your seat and receive the um, and administer it to yourself. So um, all that will be, uh, be explained during our worship services. Hope you can find the time to come out and be with us, and uh, may the Lord just care for you and all of yours during this season. God's peace be with you. Our mouths they were filled, filled with laughter. Our tongues they were loosed, loosed with joy. Restore us, O Lord, restore us, O Lord, although we are weeping, Lord, help us keep sowing the seeds of your
nations will say He has done great things The nations will sing songs of joy Restore us, O Lord Restore us, O Lord Although we are weeping Lord, help us keep so Seeds of your kingdom For the day you will reap them Your sheaves we will carry Lord, please do not tarry All those who so weeping Go out with songs of Keep sowing the seeds of your kingdom for the day we will reap them. Your sheaves we will carry. Lord, please do not tarry. All those who sow weep. So go out with songs of joy All those who so weeping Go out with songs of joy Our liturgy this morning is not our normal morning prayer liturgy that we've been doing, but instead we're adapting the family prayer in the morning service. It's a little bit shorter service, but um, it'll still sound real familiar. So we'll begin with an opening sentence from Scripture. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Join me as we say Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12 together. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. O give me the comfort of your help again, and sustain me with your willing spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We'll continue with our psalm for today, Psalm 86, that Wendell will lead us in. Our psalm this morning is a selection from Psalm 86. I'm going to sing our refrain, invite you to join with me, and then we will. Um, I'll read through the psalm. I lift my praise up to you, you alone, you are God. I lift my praise up to you, you alone, you are God. You are the Lord of the nations, all the earth sings of your praise. For there is no one like you, you alone, you are God. I invite you to join me. I lift my praise up to you, you alone, you are God. I lift my praise up to you, you alone. Our God, you are the Lord of the nations, all 
the earth sings of your praise For there is no one like you You alone, you are God There's none like you among the gods, O Lord Nor are there any works like yours all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, Lord, O Lord, my God whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered me and my soul from the depths of shale. I lift my praise up to you, you alone, you are God. I lift my praise up to you, you alone, you are God. You are the Lord of the nations, all the earth sings of your praise. For there is no one like you, you alone, you are God. Our scripture reading for today comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning in the 24th verse. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Continuing at verse 36. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our service of family morning prayer will continue with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time we'll continue in a time of prayer. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace, that we, running to obtain your promises, may be become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So we've been doing the past few weeks. We're going to continue in a time of prayer. I'm going to invite your prayers and intercessions. Let us pray for our local community on the eastern shore. Let us also pray for the unemployed, for those in financial hardship, and for local businesses. Let us pray for our nation and the world, for an end of COVID-19, for the medical community and our healthcare system, and also those in the scientific community and all first responders. Let us pray for those who are sick, who are suffering or struggling, or who have requested our prayers. We'll end our time together by praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our service today concludes with our collect, collect for the morning. O Lord, our heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Defend us by your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin nor run into any danger, and that, guided by your Spirit, we may do what is righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sing with our hearts.
hearts restored He has done great things We will say together We will feast And weep no more In the dark of night Before the dawn my soul be not afraid for the promised morning. Oh, how long, oh God of Jacob, be my strength. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored He has done great things We will say together We will feast and weep no more Every vow we pray And from the garden to the grave Bind us together, bring shalom We will feast in the house of Zion We will sing with our hearts restored done great things we will say together we will feast and weep no more and weep no more and we So this morning, um, our parable is actually part of a unit of parables, and we're following up on what Father Robert talked about a little bit last week with the parable of the sower. We have another parable that lives in the agricultural world. This parable is, is often known by two different names. Sometimes it's called the parable of the weeds. Sometimes it's been called the parable of the wheat and the tares. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about why that's the case um, in a second, but when I think about this parable and this process of weeds overtaking good crops, it immediately brings me back to memories of my childhood. My dad was an avid gardener and keeper of, his, of all the plants that grew in our yards and things like that, and so um, we, my siblings and I would often joke that he had four kids so that he didn't have to hire a, a landscaping crew, that he would just drag us out there with him. And so we spent, you know, usually an hour or two, if not more, every weekend it felt like doing different kinds of maintenance on the yard, whether that was planting new things, trimming back bushes, and our least favorite activity of all, which was pulling up weeds out of the garden. We didn't like getting in there and you know you have to you have to do weeding very carefully right if you're not weeding carefully you're you're you know you know two things are happening right one of the things is actually what the parable is talking about if you're just kind of willy-nilly pulling stuff out you might pull up something that's not a weed but the other thing that was challenging for us about weeding was making sure that we were actually getting to the root of the weed. When we would pull it up out of the ground, we weren't just pulling the top off, right? Where it would grow back, but we were kind of digging in and, and finding the end of it and pulling it out so it couldn't grow back anymore. Um, I think it was probably challenging for me because as a younger person, hopefully I've grown better with this now, but I didn't have a lot of patience for that kind of a thing. I would rather just boom, you know, knock out the weedings, go back in and, 
and do my thing, whether that was playing video games or reading a book, you know, something to get me out of the sun and, and out of this, you know, you know, terrible manual labor that my, my dad had asked us to do with him. And so um, I think it's really interesting when we look at our parable today to see, a se- I, f- I see myself in the servants and their attitude of saying, you know, find, f- waking up to find out that their, their field of wheat has been covered in, in weeds. Um, it seems like Jesus says that in the, in the parable that there's an enemy who has come in and sown weeds amongst the wheat. And their response is, well, you know, let's just, let's just get rid of it, right? Let's pull it all up. But the farmer, right, he's smarter than that. The farmer, in his wisdom, he says, wait, let's have patience. Let's not get in there and do something drastic, right? If we're not careful about this weeding process, we might actually pull up the wheat that we're looking to harvest when the time comes. And here's what's really interesting about the way that Jesus tells this parable, right? I think sometimes we forget that Jesus was really smart. I know that sounds like a very very elementary thing to say, but Jesus was smart, right? I mean, he was the God of the universe. He knows things about things. So the way that Jesus describes this process happening, the particular words he even uses to describe the weed in question is it's actually... Um, a type of plant that actually, you know, scientifically we know grows in abundance in Israel. It's a type of plant called darnel. Darnel is a poisonous plant. And what's really interesting about darnel is that when it grows, you can't tell the difference between darnel and wheat up until the point at which the wheat is ready to harvest. Even the stalks of the Darnell plant look almost identical to the wheat plant. It's got these pods, right? These these things that hold the seeds, almost like an ear of corn, right? And then they eventually sprout. And the only way you can actually tell the difference between Darnell and wheat is when wheat's ready to harvest, um, the wheat stalk grows droopy and the Darnell plant still sticks straight up. So the farmer knows this, right? The farmer knows this about the agricultural world. And he says, you know, you can't really tell the difference between what's good and what's bad right now. But let's wait. Let's, cut, let's, let's make a judgment at the end of the day where we can see the fruit of the plant and know how to, you know, know how to get rid of it. And I think that's really interesting, right? Um, the farmer, he says, wait and see. It's this reminder right in our fast-paced society that you can't microwave this kind of growth that the farmer's at, right? We, we live in a culture and a society where we're always after the instant quick solution, right? Just figure it out, knock it out, right? Like, you know, what I said when I was younger, like, let's just get the weeding done so I can go back in and play my video games or read a book. Um, but that's not what the farmer does in his wisdom. Um, it also reminds me of an experience that I had um, on a youth summer camp with my previous church that I worked at. We went to a camp and they had all kinds of um, cool rules and ideas to engage the students. And they had a really particular rule that I didn't quite understand at the beginning of the week, but as the week went by, it made a lot more sense. Um, they had an acronym that they would always say. They would always say WAFO, W-A-F-O, which stood for wait and find out. Because part of the way that the camp worked was that the leaders would know the schedule, but we intentionally didn't tell the students the schedule. Part of the idea was the le- was that the students needed to trust the leaders and the counselors, and that they just needed to wait and see what God was going to be doing throughout the week, right? Again, pushing back on that instant gratification culture that we live in. So, you know, for the first couple days of camp, kids would ask this question all the time, and the counselors would always say, Waffle, right? They're even sometimes like, you know, if we were asking that question too many times, they would even say, hey, you know, we're going to show up at dinner late if you guys keep asking, you know, kind of just reminded us that like, you need to trust your counselors. They, they know what's best. They, they're trying to give you the best experience possible. And maybe even waiting and learning how to wait well might be part of that process. And I think what this, this parable reminds me of is the fact that 
the way of the Lord, the way of the kingdom of God, it's a way of mercy. In some ways, it's a way of waiting, right? Think about this. God is waiting. Why does God wait? God waits so that he can provide time and space for us to be changed by God, right? If he was just going to get in there and have an instant result, right? Deal with our sin in the moment right there, right? We might be liable to a different sort of judgment. But God in his wisdom, right? In his steadfast love, right? As the psalm that we we read today says, right? God is slow to anger and abounding into steadfast love. That's God's character. And what that makes me think of as well today is how often we aren't willing to wait and practice mercy towards one another, right? We're, it, we're so quick to cut one another down, and then we need to wait a second and, and rem- remember that Jesus says we need to love our enemies, right? The enemy in question in this story, right, is the one who's put the, wheat, um, the weeds amongst the wheat to begin with. But the farmer doesn't go out seeking vengeance, right? He says, wait. He says, we'll see what happens. He says, we'll deal with this as this comes. Um, Jesus says not only to love our enemies, but he says, right, we need to pray for them. Um, We need to maybe get rid of this us versus them mentality, right? Because when we think us versus them, you know, 99% of that time, we always assume that that us that we're a part of are the ones who are right and the them are the enemies, right? And, And that's just not a helpful way of of living in society. That's not what Jesus asked for his followers. He doesn't ask us to, to constantly be making enemies. Jesus doesn't ask us to say, who is my enemy over and over and over. What does Jesus do? He asks us the opposite question instead, right? The question we're supposed to be asking as followers of Jesus is not who is my enemy, but actually who is my neighbor, right? Who can I serve? Who can I practice mercy and justice and love towards rather than trying to exclude people? And I think this doesn't mean that we need to just step aside and let evil in our midst reign. That, I don't think that's a helpful way of thinking about this parable. Um, and part of that, right, is this reminder that there will be judgment at the end of the day, that there are fruits that can tell us whether something is good or or bad, and if we see a bad fruit, you know, well, maybe we call it out. Maybe we do um, say this isn't right. Maybe we do speak up. Maybe that's the loving thing to do in that moment. But I also do think that part of the way we can recognize that is by recognizing who Jesus is and dealing with the sin in our life first, right? I'm reminded of what Jesus says earlier in this same gospel, right? When he talks about instead of trying to pick out the speck in your neighbor's eye, right? Taking the log out of our own eye. So maybe the first place we need to to have some reflection this morning is saying, where are there places in my own life where I'm not following Christ? Are there things that I might blame other people for that I'm actually guilty of myself? I think that same kind of introspection might give us both more mercy towards ourselves and mercy towards our neighbors, right? If we are always assuming that we're the ones who are in the right, we can, we can be more quick to rush to harsher judgments and forget that, you know, we ourselves make mistakes. We ourselves are sinful, and it's not just that person out there who... Um, is liable to sin, but it's us as well. And I think it's also a reminder too of the mercy of God and the fact that discipleship is a process, right? It takes time. Over time, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God is transforming us more and more into the likeness of Christ. Um, I came across this quote from Mother Teresa this week, right? Mother Teresa is one of the, is perhaps the patron saint of the 20th century for mercy. Um, and this is what she said, and I think it's, it's really great. Let us not forget that we are dealing with our brothers and sisters. That leper, that sick person, that drunk are all our brothers and sisters. They too have been created by a greater love. This is something that we should never forget. That sick person, that alcoholic, 
that thief are my brothers and sisters. It is possible that they find themselves abandoned and on the street because no one gave them love and understanding. You and I could be in their place if we had not received love and understanding from other human beings. I will never forget the alcoholic man who told me his story. He was a man who had surrendered to alcohol to forget the fact that no one loved him. Before we judge, we have the duty to look inside ourselves. When I read that this week in preparing for the sermon, I mean, man, that really just really went straight to my own heart, right? Anytime I'm, I'm liable to, to judge someone, that's a good check in my spirit to say, you know, is there more going on than I understand? Is there some small way even that I can show someone mercy? In, in beginning to wrap um, some of these reflections up today, um, I'm also reminded of the fact that this parable talks about waiting. Right? We are in the midst of a long season of waiting, and we don't know how much longer we're going to be waiting, but we know it's probably going to be still a little more, little while more. And I think in that waiting and knowing how I've responded to that waiting, right? sometimes well, sometimes not, what I'm reminded of is the character of God, the way that God waits. Thank God that God is not like me in the way that he waits. Thank the Lord that God waits in mercy, in love, in care for his people, even when we mess up, right? Even when we get things wrong. And I don't want to forget the fact that there is judgment at the end of the story. I think the fact that there is a judgment helps us to know that the waiting is going to be worth it because we're trusting the character of the one who is telling us to wait. We're trusting the character of God. We're trusting in the fact that Jesus is saying that there will be a time where he's going to set things right, where he's going to clear up the injustices in the world and in society. But the good news, the gospel in this parable, is not that we have to wait forever to see that happening, but it's actually already happening in our midst. This parable is about how the kingdom of God can exist even in the midst of evil all around. The kingdom is about the mercy and justice of God. It's about an overflowing of grace despite the evil that we experience in our own day-to-day -day lives and in the world around us. And so as we wait, I'm reminded that part of that waiting is trusting God and trusting that God is transforming us into his likeness. Part of that waiting means saying, how can I become more Christ-like in the way that I live? And also that process of becoming Christ-like might encourage someone else. It might encourage someone else out of a different way of living to say, hey, maybe I should take Jesus um, seriously. Maybe there's a different way to live than the evil in the world that I see around me. Maybe that person might be a witness to this kingdom that we see here in the, in the parable of the wheat and the tares.